Hello everyone. Good morning. I hope you had an excellent first day of the conference and maybe I will manage to start it uh, with a good beginning for the rest of the conference today with you. Thank you very much for being here. Everyone good? As you are still sleeping. Hands up if you are good. You are good. Okay, good. So, we're gonna deep dive today with the latest changes in Spring security. Uh, when I say latest, I kind of mean whatever ChatGPT doesn't know yet. Um, well, when, when I think about diving, I, I'm actually, this is what I'm thinking about, but that's not for today. Uh, and the material that I have uh, prepared for you for today, you can find it on this GitHub, and you can like access it right now if you want to uh, follow it together with me. Some of you have some notebooks in front of you. The following about three hours, we are going to work on some examples. I'm going to do some coding examples. You might want to follow together with me. And in addition to the examples that we are going to uh, work on together, you also find a short PDF, about 70 pages. <laughs> uh, in the GitHub, it's a summary of uh, the, the OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect chapters from my um, Spring Security in Action 2nd edition, which unfortunately is not published yet because I was too lazy. Uh, we will have a um, break somewhere at the middle of this presentation, so you can chill, take a coffee, take some fresh air or smoke a cigarette, depending on what you want to do, or even change the room. And at the very end, um, I will ask you, of course, for your feedback in the application. And I will also, for those of you who want, um, I will randomize uh, for a paper copy of my third book, which is Troubleshooting Java, because again, I was too lazy to finish my Spring Security in Action second edition. But that will be coming out soon, I, I hope. So you probably had enough time to um, access this and hopefully it's working for you. Um, again, not a lot of things about me because I, I bet you are not here for my face, you are here for what I'm gonna talk about, but in case you wanna follow me on social media, you can find me on YouTube, X, LinkedIn. People mostly know me for either the books I wrote or for my YouTube channel, um, where I try to deliver a lot of content hopefully helpful content for everyone. Thank you. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's, let's begin. So again, let's talk about Spring Security. I don't want to start with the very beginnings because I only have three hours and I would need at least a week if I want to go in details with absolutely everything. So it will be a deep dive. I'm not sure how much deeper, but I tried to collect the information that I consider to be the most essential for today, which is what has been changed, which is uh, the OAuth 2 part, including the authorization server. So in the first part of our today's presentation, we are going to discuss about the changes in Spring Security in general, and then we are going to go uh, into the authorization server part, work on some examples. You. Uh, we'll have the chance to ask questions. Actually, please do ask your questions whenever you want. So just shout, because I'm pretty sure it's, it's impossible to, to see up to the uh, back um, of this room. It's a very large one. So if you just raise your hand, I will probably miss you. And I was informed we don't have a secondary microphone, so you will have to shout and I will have to repeat your question. But please do that whenever you you want, so even if I don't ask you for the questions. Yeah, this is when, when you think about Spring Security, it's a very large ecosystem, actually. It's just a small part of the Spring ecosystem, but it's still very large, and it deals with the authentication, authorization, 
uh, the uh, protection mechanisms, defense mechanisms, and it also gives you support for integration testing, which we know is very important because, uh, well, you don't want to have any library or framework uh, being used by your application where you didn't also uh, invest some time in testing the integration with that framework because, as you know, we uh, hopefully and usually um, often enough upgrade our dependencies and nothing guarantees you that there are no breaking changes, no there can be breaking changes and that's about any uh, any framework or library you use. So one of my advice is always do invest time in integration testing which, with whichever framework you are using. And uh, normally any framework uh, or library should also provide support for testing and Spring Security does that. Um, you also know that you can apply uh, Spring Security for either reactive uh, applications or for imperative written applications. So it's quite a complex framework and a vast one. But let's let's go into the the changes that came in the let's say past year or so. So exactly as I as I said, since uh, um, the the moment ChatGPT doesn't know about them. So hopefully, if you ask ChatGPT now, uh, it, it still shouldn't be able to tell you about these changes. I'm I'm not sure exactly. I didn't test it this morning, but uh, it shouldn't. Um, so one of the the biggest changes I think. Um, is the extension of the Web Security Configure Adapter class that disappears. Uh, this is not like so recent. I think it was introduced more than a year ago, uh, but uh, it was optional up to a point, so you could skip it. Uh, depending on if you've up upgraded already your uh, application to Spring Boot 3 or not, you will have the surprise of having to uh, change this uh, mandatory because it doesn't only becomes de become deprecated, it also has been completely removed. So uh, I'm, I'm just curious um, to see, uh, is, um, is anyone of you here still working on a version that is below three? So quite a lot of you, I'm happy to see that because you will be, that, that will be informative for you, no? Uh, and uh, already upgraded to Spring Boot 3 or maybe started a new application. Also, it's maybe half-half. So uh, some of you uh, might already have the experience of upgrading. Some of you, uh, they started from, from scratch, so they don't even maybe know what Web Security Configure Adapter is. Uh, and some of you, half of you at least, will have to upgrade your application, so you will have to remove the Web Security Configure Adapter class in case you haven't done that yet. Uh, again, I say in case you haven't done that yet because normally it was deprecated for a while, so you might have been lazy and stayed there without uh, upgrading it, or uh, you might have been eagerly uh, acting on it and maybe you have already removed it and introduced the security filter chain. Um, so the idea is that you will not have uh, extension anymore and you will have to introduce the uh, security filter chain bin, uh, which from my point of view is an excellent change because it introduces a better way to decouple the code, test it, um, and yeah, keep it loosely coupled, you know, it's, which is very important. So it improves the flexibility of the configuration, but not only for the configuration, but also for testing uh, your, uh, your configuration. So the testability, the maintainability is improved. Uh, this is one of the, the tweets for, from like a few days ago, September 29 from, from Mario Fusco. Um, it's uh, about modularity, you know, so I, I really liked it and I found it close to our discussion here. It says, don't turn off the light because al it also operates the elevator. Funny or not, this is how my uh, shower cabin works at home. So if you, if you turn off the light, the, the shower cabin doesn't work anymore. So uh, I can say that it, I didn't follow completely this, uh, these examples myself, but normally, that's what we should do. So modularity, decoupling, okay. Um, put it there as much as possible. And with the uh, removal of the Web Security Configuration Adapter, now um, the Spring Security Configuration is more decoupled and easier to test and implement as well. 
So this is how it's done now. You don't have uh, a configure method you override. You have a bin, you can configure it. You have a nice builder method that creates the, the instance. You put it in the context with the simple addition of the bin annotation and that's it. What other changes um, have been uh, happening lately? So if you, say, work on an older version, 2.6 of Spring Boot, uh, which, of course, uh, links to an older version of Spring Security, you would probably use the authorized requests. Um, and a lot of people know this method because, well, it was like there for 20 years. So if you wrote Spring Security configurations, you've seen this method and you used it quite a lot to apply endpoint authorization rules. And this method, first of all, uh, has been deprecated and then, then it, it uh, was completely removed to be replaced with a similar one called authorized HTTP requests. Um, and it looks like this. So you have the just it's, it looks like only have to add a word there. Uh, of course, behind the scenes, that was easier to make a removal and um, and a completely complete replacement. Um, but the idea is that the naming also is a little bit, bit more suggestive because in, in Spring Security, you know, you can apply authorization rules at the endpoint level if, if you have a web application, but nobody says that you always have a web application, so you, you might not even have endpoint security if your application is not a web application. And even if you have a web application, you can still apply authorization configurations at the method level throughout all the bins of your application. Uh, which fits pretty well with uh, either layered, uh, uh, layered architectures, layered design, or with hexagonal architecture or design works pretty well as well because you can apply uh, independently your uh, security. So why name it authorized request? Because, yeah, maybe you say request, it's, it always leads you to a HTTP request, but I would not say that necessarily the word request should always um, light uh, a bulb on, on HTTP. So the naming, naming is better. Then, if you upgraded your dependency, maybe starting with Spring Boot 3.1 and further, did you do that? So 3.1 here, do we have 3.1? So a little bit less in number. So the, the more I raise the version, the number of hands uh, goes, uh, goes lower. Um, if you haven't upgraded, then you might still be using the chain syntax, which is the one you see on the first row. Are you using that in your apps? A lot of you, no? You are still using that. You will have to change it. So uh, these methods um, will not allow you anymore to chain the configurations. You will have to use a, config, uh, a, a, cust a customizer object. Uh, which is quite easy to implement because um, it's a functional interface, so you can override it through a lambda uh, through a, through a lambda function, as you can see down below. So what whatever you see on being changed af chained after the method, it goes uh, as a lambda function, as you can see on the on the below. And then, maybe one of the most, uh, yeah, let's say we, we waited a lot for this, um, and I, I, honestly, I didn't think that it will ever happen, is the, the removal of the matchers method. Because, see, the, first of all, there were a lot of them. And secondly, wherever you would search for them in, in terms of examples online, Stack Overflow, for example. We are using Stack Overflow a lot, no, still, even if, uh, even if we have now Copilot and ChatGPT, and even, even after that, we'll use Stack Overflow, because no, they, they implemented their own AI, and it will be there soon. Um, uh, but all the examples were actually very old, and I found quite often as, uh, as a consultant, I, I do interact with a lot of uh, organizations and a lot of projects and a lot of teams, and as a trainer, the same. Uh, and I, I did find very often uh, 
uh, developers who don't understand didn't understand the differences between uh, the matchers method and this could even lead and and in some cases it led to uh, vulnerabilities like do you know the difference between ant and mvc matchers for example who who is here using ant matchers or have used be before they upgrade it because now it's not possible anymore and who is using mvc matchers okay so if you use ant matchers do you know the difference between ant and mvc matchers that's that's the question that you should ask yourself because there are cases like both of them they look they look very similar no if you if you take them you'd say they are identical you can even replace one with the other and your compilation will not fail and in in many cases it will even work the same uh, but in not not in all the cases and you have to make sure that you are not on the corner cases where the two of them don't work the same because what happens is that with one of them you have if with end matches especially if you are not enough enough attentive and you don't cover yourself all the cases with the patterns that you apply on the paths then you might end up with the same path not being secured because it can be accessed through a different path um, which is is crazy, but but I've seen it happening more than one time in applications. Um, yeah, of course, regex matchers that didn't create a lot of confusion, and I didn't even, I don't think I have ever seen it actually used in in a real world um, app ever. But uh, it got removed as well. And now instead of using and then MVC matchers, we use uh, request matchers. And that's it. So you don't have multiple options. You just have to use request measures. And with that, the confusion, I would say, it, it went out. It, you don't have any, any more confusion. The access method was not one of my favorites, to be honest. And it wasn't one of my favorites because it's using, uh, and it forces you to use like Spring expression language. And I don't have anything with Spring, Spring expression language if it looks like that, like is authenticated, pretty clear and nice. Everyone can understand what that does, no? But if you have a Spring expression language on three, four, or five rows, try to debug that when something happens. And that's something I avoid using. I, I avoided using in the access method on, on the endpoint level. And I also avoided using at the method level a lot of uh, in a lot of cases I've seen and I would say too often I, I, I have seen um, authorization rules implemented on uh, pre-authorized and post-authorized uh, maybe pre-filter post-filter but they are not not quite often encountered but on pre-authorized and post-authorized uh, authorization rules there you know you have to add a spring expression language and you see a, a rule that is on three or four lines don't do that because it's very difficult to debug and if something happens you will have uh, you, you'll have to deal with uh, with a big headache okay I always prefer to move it preferably in uh, uh, an object in as a, a behavior of an object that I can even test properly no I can uh, uh, write all the needed unit tests integration tests and so on uh, and if something happens then it's of course easier to add a, a breakpoint on a line of a Java code rather than trying to to see what happens in a very long uh, spring expression so instead of having to directly add the spell there uh, you now have an object that is called an authorization manager and you can implement that authorization manager interface and you can implement whatever logic you want for the access method in Java so in code normal code of course it was like really improper to not give you something to replace it with uh, if you wanted to upgrade, no, because say you you already have used this in your application, and now you need to upgrade, uh, and you know you don't want to like re literally rewrite logic in your code when you do upgrades. When you move from even a major major version to another of a library, you want to do that as quick quickly as possible. So the backwards compatibility needs to be in place, and in most cases, that's what happens with. Java itself as a language and with the majority of the um, large frameworks and libraries you don't have big changes so um, 
Spring Security provides you with the Web Expression Authorization Manager, and the Web Expression Authorization Manager is uh, the implementation that works exactly as the access method was working previously, it takes the Spring Expression language as a parameter, and the only thing you need to change is make sure that instead of having the string directly there, you have an instance of this implementation. Yeah, and this is, well, of course, as I said, the interface is authorization manager, that's the contract, you can implement it, you can have your own implementation, but you have uh, a few of them already provided, and Web Expression Authorization Manager is one of them. And the last major change you need to know about when you will upgrade is that um, the enable global method security annotation will be simply replaced by enable method security. Uh, first of all, it sounds shorter and nicer. Um, I don't know what that global really means there. Uh, and secondly, the pre-post enabled flag is true by default, so you don't have to write it. There are three flags there, uh, enabling the pre-authorized, post-authorized, pre-filter, post-filter annotations. This is the pre-post enable flag. Uh, it's one to uh, enable the secured annotation and another one to enable the roles allowed annotation. Uh, both the secured and roles allowed being quite old and probably you don't use them anymore. Do you use them? Secured and roles allowed? No one. Ah, one, one person, okay. Um, yeah, they were mainly for um, um, helping you migrate to, to Spring and Spring Security in the early days. Uh, but since, in the, as you have seen, you know, even here in the room, in the majority of cases, you now, all of us, we do use only pre-authorized, post-authorized, pre-filter and post-filter. We always had to like put pre-post enabled on true, and that's it, okay? And before going in the second uh, part of the presentation, let's actually try to, to upgrade ourselves um, a demo uh, app here, which you also have on the GitHub uh, repository that I, I have provided to you. Um, by the way, about that PDF, it's a long one, so I, I, I didn't joke, it's, it's quite a long one. I don't expect you go necessarily through it right now, it's your homework for afterwards, okay? I just put in place as a summary about what we're gonna discuss in the second part of our presentation. We are gonna just work here together, but I want you to have something to read afterwards, and, and that's it. Oh, and by the way, uh, it's not edited, and as you know, maybe, and if you didn't, you can see now, I'm not a native English speaker, which means that I might have mistakes there, so uh, I don't, it's taken from the content of, of my second edition of my book, but it's, it's not at the quality the book is, so I don't want to, you to believe that uh, that my, my book will be like very poor quality, not to use uh, another bad word, yeah. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do here, so I'm, I, I just have this, this project and is the code large enough? Can you see it? You can see it, okay. Yeah, so it's, uh, um, I, I, I just assumed that I took this, uh, this very small application, I, I don't know anything about it. It has some code there, I don't care what it does. The only thing I want is to upgrade it to, um, to the latest version, okay? So it's, uh, as you can see, it's a Spring Boot 2.6 point something. So I need to make it at, le at least three, so I, I want to. to have a 3.1 point something, okay? Um, okay, let, let's see what happens if we do that. So, first of all, I will check if any dependencies um, need to be changed as well. And normally, I should change at least one. I, I know I have it here, which is the MySQL dependency. But let's see if, uh, if it shows with red first. Okay, fine enough. See, it's not there anymore. Which is, I know, not related to Spring Security, but I wanted to tell you why I'm doing that. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm just changing it with the repository where it has been moved, and I'm, I'm making sure first that my dependencies work. But then, of course, next thing I'm going to do is I'm try, trying to find the, the Spring security configurations, and normally I should have a lot of problems there. Yeah. Because this is an old, uh, an, an, an old um, configuration, the way we used to do it. So you can see all the old annotations there. We use the enable global method security, and then we extend the web security configure adapter. That's now displayed with read by IntelliJ because there is no longer any class such as web security configure adapter. We override the configure method, and since we don't extend any 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 class. No, we don't. We can't have an overriding. Um, the the HTTP basic. Um, well, it it does now have a parameter. You can you cannot use it without a parameter and the chaining as you used to. So there are all all the problems here that uh, that we've seen. And of course, it's only the like the largest part of the problem. So let's let's start. Uh, with I think the the biggest one is having to to extend web security configure adapter. I see Copilot doesn't agree with me now. It doesn't agree with me. It wants me to, to do that. No, I don't want to do that. So no Copilot, no. We don't want to extend Web Security Configurator anymore. Um, and then probably the easiest is here to just change it to the method configure to security filter chain. Not necessary, but I usually do change the name of the method as well. And then I make sure that I edit this as a bin in in the spring context. Furthermore, so this is HTTP basic, but it applies to any authentication configuration. So it could have been form login, it could have been uh, a route to resource server, it could have been any of the DSL methods that we use to set up authorization. This is just an example. Uh, so what we need to do here is to make sure that we have now. I don't have anything configured after this. If I would have had anything configured, then I would have gone here and I would have implemented uh, the customizer for it. Uh, since uh, since I don't have anything, what I can do is call the with defaults method, which is basically doing nothing. It's just returning a, a nothing custom customizer. I'm not sure how to call it, but it's just an empty an empty customizer. And yeah, in this case, I'm doing that because again, I, I see nothing after the method. But if I would have had anything, then I would have had to move everything from the down below the chaining into the customizer. Um, and then uh, the authorized request. So the same problem here. So we have actually we have multiple problems. First of all is that you cannot use chaining, no? So I, I have to do something like this first of all. Just put it like, like this. And then there is no authorized request. No, it, it normally uh, it should be authorized HTTP requests. I'm, I'm not even sure if that would actually even work, the authorized request with the version that I'm using here. But normally it shouldn't. And anyway, normally you shouldn't use it. So you should also change it as we discussed a little bit earlier in the slides. Uh, and now you can see that I, I'm doing something after the method. So I, I was chaining some configuration. All the configuration that I would, I'm chaining, I have to move it in the customizer. So I cannot use anymore the customizer with defaults as I was doing in the uh, HTTP basic call. So I need to implement a customizer this time. But uh, as I told you, you can easily do it with a Lambda if it's a small one. Now, one of the advantages and I will not put it in place now, but one of the advantages for having a customizer is the fact that you can decouple the implementation. So down below here, I'm using some course configuration. When I'm getting into this, I want to tell you that what you see there in uh, my code is not the way I would like to see it in your code. Um, and that's it. Uh, we are used to put the, all the configurations in one place, and that was one of the bad things with chaining. Maybe you asked yourself, why the heck do they took even the time to, uh, to uh, disallow you using chaining, and now they force you using the lambda expression and the customizer? It's because of what we discussed earlier, 
modularization, decoupling, the possibility to take things out and test them independently. So sometimes it's better to force developers to give them a, a, a nudge, give them a hint, hey, you should do that. Like, it's not easy to test your uh, security configurations when you have them chained. But if you have an instance that you can take outside in a separate class, in a method, then you can also implement the tests for it. And maybe you are even tempted to do that, and you should be tempted to do that. Like in my case here, and this is of, of course a very small demonstrative example, but real world apps don't have such short configurations. They have large configurations and you want to test them. And you don't want to have a large configuration file. You want to be able even to split your security configuration in multiple files easily. And then you want to be able to take out everything that's configuration to be sure that you have it somewhere independently and uh, easy, easier to test. So, of course, I will continue on my example here. I'm just going to say it like this, but what I was explaining again is normally in a real world app, uh, there would be more than just this, and then I would have to move them out and I would move them out. And that applies to all the configurations. And now, of course, uh, we don't have any uh, matchers method, no, so we have to change this as well. No AND matchers, no MVC matchers, no regex matchers, so we just have to, to change with the only method we have. And then the access method, in case you have it, then it doesn't, um, it doesn't use uh, directly a spell as a parameter, you have to use uh, web manager implementation, uh, um, an authorization manager, sorry, implementation. Uh, and that's what we're gonna do now. If we are, uh, we, we need to be quick with our upgrade, of course, the, and, and, or maybe we don't have such a large expression, like in this case here, it, it works fine for me. Um, even if, of course, if I would have only this authorized, I would not use the access method in the first place, but yeah, let's say we have a small uh, implementation, then you you do use the implementation that Spring Security provides for that, and that's it. If you have a larger implementation, which very often happens with the access method, because again, it doesn't really make sense to implement the access, to, to write the access, to use the access method uh, just to, to say is authenticated or something very small. In most cases where I've seen that, it's a large, uh, logic written as a, a spell, uh, then my recommendation is you uh, implement the authorization manager interface uh, and you write your logic there separately and then you test it, okay? So we have to be very careful with our code and make it uh, as clean as possible and, and test it as much as possible. Uh, and if not you, someone will thank you for that at some point. It might be you, because you are still working on the project. You might have left the project, but someone else will think you will say, hey, I love the, I, I love the one who, uh, who wrote this, this code. It's so beautiful, it's clean, and it's tested. And you should think about that. Anyway, um, again, I, I can't use the default here because I have something, so I need to I need to move uh, to move it here, and uh, as you can see, um, the guys had something with all the methods containing the word ant or MVC. So you will not have the ignoring. Uh, that was not on my slides, but you you see it now. So it's ignoring request matchers, same as the request matchers above. It uh, it sounds uh, familiar, no? And then of course we have the course, which in my case here was uh, already written the right way, let's put it like that. But what, what's not okay with this is not related to my upgrading, it's related to the way I wrote the code. And for me, this is logic. And whenever I see, at least if I see curly braces on a lambda expression, it tells me that uh, I should somehow take that out. It's a little bit more 
then I would need, would need to have in there. No, I would move this out. Not something that we will do now, but as an idea. And of course, then you have to build and, and return this uh, this instance, and that's it. Uh, that, that's it actually for uh, for removing all of the web security configurer adapter. And then what whatever I still need to do, so I, I need to use the enable method security. And then when I when I change that, you automatically see that the true uh, flag for the pre-post enabled became gray because that's the way uh, IntelliJ tells me that's uh, not needed. Uh, now, of course, if you go in this, you will see that only the pre-post enable is now default true because that's what we use as a convention. You no, know, we try to have the convention as much as possible in place. We have without having to explicitly do something about it, and that was the main problem. Actually, uh, the main problem was that the convention was not in place. No, not that you have to like, right? Uh, but secured, enabled, and J uh, JSR two hundred and fifty. Uh, which is related to the rows allowed annotation, that one, uh, th those ones are still on false because normally they are not convention. Normally you should not use them and preferably you should uh, replace them with, uh, with pre-authorized and post-authorized wherever you, you have them. Um, okay, and I think that's everything with my upgrading here. Of course, again, it's just a demonstrative application. Never use the no password encoder in a, in a production uh, uh, code. Uh, but I just designed this to, to try to show you live all the upgrading uh, stuff. Do you have any questions by now? Yes, please. Uh, you changed the uh, um, ant matcher with the directly matcher? Uh, like with the request matcher, yes. Yeah, very, very good question. Yeah, very good question. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. The question is, uh, I have replaced uh, the, in this case, MVC measures or whatever with the request measures. And on the previous slide, we have seen that we actually had three different methods working in three different complete ways. Uh, and now I, I have uh, replaced it with only one. Is this working still the same? Now, it's very close. The, the answer is, it's very close. So I, I have observed that uh, if you, for example, have a slash at the end, it will not work anymore like MVC matchers in this case. And normally here you will use ant expressions, so exactly as uh, as you would have been doing with the uh, ant matchers and MVC matchers. Uh, but uh, when whenever I would try this, if I don't have integration codes, uh, I would try to test it and be very attentive because in my previous um, project where I had to do this, I had to upgrade exactly what I, what I did with you here from two point something to, to three point something. Um, we had exactly this problem um, where some of the URLs would have used a slash uh, at the end and uh, some of them didn't. And at some point when we were running the end-to-end -end test, we observed that the stuff is not working anymore and we discovered that is because of this. So uh, what we were expecting to, to work uh, smoothly, like re um, replacing, solely replacing the MVC matcher with request matcher didn't, didn't work exactly very, very smoothly. We had some problems, we had tests in place, we discovered them. And then, of course, we uh, we also um, were attentive. Uh, we we did some, let's say, uh, manual manual verifications to be to be sure. Not only we didn't only even rely on the tests, but um, we had this problem. So um, I hope I, I answered your question. Thank you for the question. Any other question? Please, there. Yes. Yeah. So in my case, thank you for the question. Did my test fail because they were authenticated or because they were like um, 
rejecting the requests. I think that was the question, no? And they were failing in that case because they were rejecting my request. So in, in, they were not authenticated, uh, but the app didn't work. Like the front end application would not have worked anymore in that case because it was the, the uh, authorization actually was failing in that case. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Any other question? I hear only silence, so I think we can uh, we can continue in that case. Okay, amazing. Cool. Uh, with that being said, so let me see uh, when when is the like half of this presentation? Just to be sure that I uh, we still have some uh, some time now. Um, uh, so let's let's start in this case with the OpenID Connect and the Wauth 2. So I'm I'm very happy to be here with you and to tell you that we have a way to implement a fully working Wauth 2 and OpenID Connect system with Spring and Spring Security. Uh, because there were times where we couldn't do that um, for a short history. Uh, of how things work. So previously we had a separate dependency that we were using to implement an OAuth, uh, an OAuth server, authorization server, and a separate dependency that we were using to implement a resource server. So if you wanted to implement an OAuth system, what you needed to do is to use these separate dependencies and um, implement your uh, your stuff okay at some point uh, they needed to to be upgraded and they need to work also with open id connect which wasn't happening at that point so open id connect is a protocol uh, over the wow to specification that is more focused on authentication uh, i think there was a, already a presentation that was really good yesterday on this topic so i don't want to uh, push uh, more on that um, but uh, yeah, just imagine we need to make sure that you can really build secure stuff with Spring and Spring Security, and uh, some of of the parts like even even if you think about authentication, um, if you already have Spring Security, why should you have a separate dependency which does also authentication but somehow different? So I think one, one of the, the main points, uh, main good points, uh, main good additions was that um, we uh, need to have all the authentication in only one, one dependency. So you use Spring Security already. Let's be able to do everything with Spring Security without needing to have a separate dependency if it's still also about authentication. It, it didn't serve a different purpose in the end. Uh, so it, it was kind of strange. If you want to see how uh, old stuff worked, for example, uh, there are uh, still on my YouTube channel some videos from like three or four years ago where you can see exactly how to build uh, just for your curiosity maybe. Maybe you still have some, I know, old code. Um, and I think uh, a part of it is also in my first edition of Spring Security in Action. Uh, meaning if you if you have the old code there, you will have to work a little bit more than just what I've showed you in this uh, beginning of the of the presentation where I only discussed about uh, the small spring security additions. If it's about OAuth 2 and you are using the old way with the enable resource server annotation, enable authorization server annotation, if, if these sound familiar for you, uh, and you have them in your code, you will have more work to invest or more effort to invest to upgrade your application. Do you use them? Any unlucky guy here? Only one there in the back. <laughs> I'm sorry for you. <laughs> so, yeah. Otherwise, if, if you don't use them and or you want to implement a new system now, uh, first of all, you have pa the part of authentication, the part of the resource server is directly in Spring Security. So it's quite easy. You just use the normal way. Um, you saw the HTTP basic earlier. You probably knew it or form login or whatever uh, authentication method you would configure. The same you can do with uh, uh, a resource server or with single sign-on. Uh, and uh, um, 
starting like maybe less than a couple of years ago, um, a new authorization server dependency started to be built and now it's definitely in a phase in which you can use it and it, it looks excellently. I, I, will, I will prove you today that you can cover the main cases with a, a small effort because we will do that together. We will work on the, on the code together. And for the details that I cannot give you in the short time that we have, um, a part of them you will find them in the document, uh, another part of them uh, even deeper you will find it on my YouTube channel. And if they're still not there, you can anytime find me on social media and ask me the question. I will try to, to uh, find some time to, to create that example. Um, just to have an overview and don't step too quickly into writing the code and making sure that everyone knows what we are going to work on. Wanted to um, uh, remind you a bit about the architecture and the flow that we are going to test and what we'll be discussing. So um, for this demonstration, I plan to use the most complex of the grant types, uh, the most complex of the authentication flows, which is the authorization code with Pixie. And a very common one, uh, one of the most used uh, flows when we have a user. So it's a, it's a grant type. Uh, defined for the user, that's why the user is there. So the user tries to use a client, the client can be a mobile application or it can be a web application, something running in the web browser I mean. Uh, the flow is, uh, is easy, just follow the arrows, so the client needs to get, needs, needs to make sure that the user is authenticated, so it needs to authenticate on behalf of the user. To do that, it asks the user to uh, sign up somehow, to, to log in somehow, sorry. Um, and the most common way is probably using a simple set of credentials, username and password. It provides the client with a token, so that golden key there is the token, a proof that the authentication happened successfully. The token usually has to expire at some point, but uh, up to the point where it expires, uh, it can be used by the client to access the resources on behalf of the user. So the backend of the application is what we call a resource server in terms of uh, the OAuth2 terminology, but it's simply just the backend of the application that's protecting resources. And somehow this backend uh, gets a token with the request. It needs to make sure the token is valid. And if the token is valid, it allows the, the uh, call to, to happen. Of course, of course, based also on all the authorization uh, configurations that are in place. Um, so it's basically just, uh, if you look at it like it's user client backend and the se separating in a different service, the, the part for um, authentication. Uh, there are different ways in which the backend validates the token depending on how you implement it. Today I will try to show as much as possible. Uh, we'll try to first of all use a uh, non-opaque token, uh, which uh, JVT is basically the, the most common implementation, probably the only that we use today. Uh, and uh, we can also try with an opaque token, case in which um, the resource server uh, meaning the backend of the application will be forced to do introspection. And my plan and the reason why I show you all this is to show you that the new authorization server framework that you can use to implement an authorization server allows you to easily do all that. The, basically, all the specification is supported at the moment and you can use it, enhance it, implement it in your applications with, I would say, not so much effort. Yeah. And then let's uh, let's recap a bit also the flow because we are going to to do it. Maybe I will return to this diagram also when we um, we follow it. So um, as we we will manually follow it. So we don't have a client and we will not build a client because that would 
first of all take us a lot of time secondly if i would do that it should be a web application and let's say that i'm not really a front-end developer uh, so it would be difficult for me but we can like follow it using a browser and postman or url or whatever tool you have to call um, and to to make an http request so the user which you still see now on the left so this is the user tries to use the client uh, we assume first that the client doesn't have a valid token. One of the ways in which it can get a token is uh, to uh, ask the user to log in. So when the user tries to do something, the client discovers, hey, I don't have a token, and it's redirecting the user to a page where they can log in uh, to prove who they are. So once the, the user logs in, and very importantly, so the user has been redirected in the browser, but now it logs in the page that is provided by the authorization server. This is a very important aspect. So the client never touches the uh, user's credentials, okay? There was, at some point, a uh, grant type that was called the password grant type. The password grant type was the one where the user would log in in a form provided by the client and then the client would send the credentials to the authorization server and get the token. That one is deprecated and it's not recommended you use it anymore. So avoid using it. I know uh, I've heard this feedback well, but uh, it's complicated to rely always on the authorization server what if i want to have my own uh, my own uh, login um, it's not feasible no imagine imagine uh, you would want to have authentication with facebook or with with gmail or whatever how would it be uh, facebook or gmail allow you create an application where you can access the user's Gmail or Facebook credentials. That would be totally insecure from the authorization server point of view. No, so no password grant type, don't do that. Always, there should be only one manager of user details if you want to be able to keep them protected. And that's it, that's the authorization server. So that's why the user logs in, you are redirected in the browser to some other application. That other application is the authorization server. For example, if you have, I don't know, Keycloak, for example, you will be redirected to Keycloak. Yeah? If you have uh, authentication with Gmail, you will be redirected to Google. If you have Facebook to Facebook and so on and so forth. So you leave the responsibility of the management of the user details to the authorization server. And then, if everything is fine, then what the authorization server does, it returns back, not a token, an authorization code. Uh, this is another important detail that sometimes creates confusion if it's the first time you see this flow. Why the heck didn't it provide the token directly? Because if you go down below and see the next steps, then using this code, uh, the, the client asks for the token and then gets the token. So couldn't it simply get the token here at step number four? Well, it could, and that was actually uh, another grant type that's called the implicit grant type. And guess what? It's also deprecated. You shouldn't use it anymore because uh, it's very easy being a redirect this one. Yeah, that's, that's the big difference. So may maybe you, 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 you will see now the, the reason is here on the diagram, designed as the difference of the arrows, one of them being dotted, and the other one being a straight line, okay? The dotted one is a redirect. The straight line is simply a HTTP response. That's a big difference, okay? Because the redirect can be easily faked to grab, and if someone, to, to grab the, 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 the data, and if someone grabs the token, then the bearer of the token is has the power it's like the golden ring the precious ring in lord of the rings no you have it you have the full power so you don't want that 
okay, then someone asks, but if I have the authorization code, then can't I go? And then we use step number five, five and still get a token because I, I got the same way I got the authorization code. Well, first of all, even with the weak approach where you don't use Pixie, which I will discuss and apply today, uh, you would still have to use some credentials of the client that you would need to know in advance. The authorization code is normally usable only once, even if it fails. If you, and we can prove this here, if you fail using it for any reason, you have to get another one. So it's not that easy. And you would, you would still, to, to execute step number five, you still have to authenticate somehow. The simplest authentication way is using the client credentials which are basically a set of credentials identifying the client, not the user. If you implemented the flow using Pixie, which is proof key for code exchange, no, follow the name, proof key for code exchange. It's a key that you use to get the authorization code, okay, securely. Then what happened in that case is that the client will make sure, actually, sorry, the authorization server will make sure that the client uh, which asked for the user to log in is the same client that will get the code. How does it do that? When the client redirects the user to authenticate, it provides also with a value. That value is the hash of a randomly generated value. So it works like this. Let me put it in a notepad, okay? So at this line here, where it's redirecting, so basically it's uh, one redirect, this one, it generates two value, a random value and the hash of the random value. What do we know about a hash function? a hash cryptographic function. It can't, be reversed. it can't be reversed. I think that's one of the most important things we need to, uh, we, we need at least for this example here. So what happens is that the client sends here together with the request through the re request to the authorization server to authenticate the user, it sends the hash. What happens if someone intercepts this call? They will get the hash. What they can do with the hash? Absolutely nothing, because it can't be reversed, okay? But then, here, when at step number five, the same client would like to get a token, it can get the token unless the same client will send the random value based on which the hash has been done. Well, since the hash can't be reversed, if you somehow intercepted it, you can't get anyway the random number. And since it's always different for every request, it's quite easy to assume that if the one who sent the request at point 0.5 is the, uh, knows that value, is the same client that made the request initially. Okay. Phew. So now we need to put this in place, okay? Um, this is like it's one hour already. I would say let's, let's try to start at, at least a bit on the code and then I will give you the chance to choose a better presentation. <laughs> no, just take a break, I'm joking. You can come back here. Uh, have a coffee and then uh, then uh, come back. But let's let's at least begin um, writing um, the code. So um, I'm I'm gonna um, let's call it like this. Okay, I'm gonna uh, create a new project. Java twenty one. Not that it matters. No. <laughs> Okay, not for us here, it matters. It matters very much, but not for us here, okay? But I don't want to say that I didn't use the latest and the greatest um, right here um, in my presentation. So, 
um, we want to create an authorization. So I'm gonna I'm gonna add three dependencies and the authorization server is in the initializer now if you tried to use it like a bit of a time ago you wouldn't have seen that and you would have had to um, to uh, manually add it to the pom xml but now it's in the initializer so you find it in uh, the web version of the initializer or simply in your um, IntelliJ if you are using IntelliJ and I'm going to create it. Okay. And let me actually step a bit um, and discuss about this. Maybe it's better to do that before. So this was the dependency that you would have had to add. Now this is uh, Maven dependency, I see that I, uh, by mistake, um, uh, created a, a Gradle uh, project here, but it's, it's no difference, so it doesn't make any difference for us. So it's the same dependency that you, you would use, but just written a little bit differently now in Gradle. And these are the components that we need to build in the second part of the presentation, uh, so after, after the break. Uh, we will customize all of this normally some of them they are out of the box so if i were lazy i could have simply just created a very like simple authorization server without showing you some of this at all but i won't do that because in a real world example you you will not be able to skip them i promise you you'll have to try them anyway so I don't want to go simple by convention and just show you that you can almost writing nothing um, implement an authorization server. I would like to actually go through these components and try to explain them as good as I can in the, the time that I have been provided with. Uh, so that if you will need to implement it, you will at least know where to start from better than just add the dependency and it's working. Okay. So we, we will have to implement two filters, which one of them is the normal one we write for any application where we apply the authorization rules for the endpoints. Uh, and we will also have uh, an, a filter to customize uh, the authorization server. These are the two we will start with. They are just simple. You've seen them at the beginning of, of the presentation, security filter chains or instances that we will add in the context. And being that we had two of them, we will also have to use the order annotation um, for them to, to give them an order. And then you have seen earlier no, that we have users so, and you have clients. So the authorization server deals with users and it deals with clients. So normally you need to implement some user details management, meaning at least the credentials of the user's management, and the client details management, meaning the credentials, at least the credentials for the client. But in case of the client, there is more than just the credentials mandatory. You will need to, in case we use, for example, the authorization uh, uh, code grant type, you need to have a redirect URL because otherwise the server doesn't know where to redirect you. You need to have uh, the scopes which um, are requested by the client when they access a resource um, and some other configurations but I think the minimum this this is actually at least the minimum and the, the authentication method as well and then there are the app settings uh, which is a bin where you can configure some general characteristics of, the, of your server and in case you use uh, signed tokens, and if you use JVT, then you do use signed tokens. Then you need to have some key pairs management, a component that deals with uh, the the keys. Yeah, depending on exactly what you use, you might not need one or the other. For example, if you implement the client credentials grant type only, you don't need users because the client credentials grant type, as the name suggests, is for the clients only. So you don't need users. So this component might be missing. 
if you don't use the only the gener general settings, the default settings, then you might not need to customize the app settings. If you use opaque tokens and not JVTs, you don't need the key pairs management. It works without. But I will try to make an example to put all of them in place uh, because I don't know exactly what you will need at some point. So it's better it's better to discuss them than than not to discuss them. Okay. Um, okay, so we, we can start with our implementation. Experimental alert, whatever. So I'll say let's create a config package and a configuration class. Anyone has any questions before I start? Still? If things are clear, then we can continue. Okay, so we add the configuration. No enable authorization server annotation, no any other annotation, at least for our example, that's not needed. Remember, those are the old annotations. Uh, but we need to uh, implement, I'm going back here, uh, the filters first. Okay, so I'm going to say security filter chain, um, authorization server security filter chain. I'm going to throw the exception because I know that will happen when I'm going to uh, call the build method here. I'm going to add, of course, the bean annotation. And, okay, the order, let's, let's keep it for the end when we see why we add it. And now, there are a few default configurations. You could write them manually, but the authorization server provides you with a, a utilitary method that comes handful to configure everything so configuration okay so the only thing you need to do is start by applying the default security okay and then next thing if we want to continue the configuration we have to get the configurer to get the same configurer and for example one of the things that you would normally do is at least probably, in most cases, enable OpenID Connect. I think that is most of the cases now. So if you want to enable, so not only use the UAuth2 specification, but enable what is above the uh, UAuth2 through OpenID Connect, then you need to call the OpenID Connect. Uh, it has been designed with a customizer, like similar to all the other things that you have seen in the later, latest uh, version of Spring Security. So, of course, you can, if you don't, don't want to apply any customization, specific customization, you can just use the with defaults, for example, like we did in the previous uh, example, uh, or you can customize it further. Now, we will not go through all of this, but if you want to uh, customize things even, even deeper, for example, you can customize the token or the authorization endpoints logic and provide some specific authorization providers for that. You can customize absolutely everything here, like you started with the defaults, but you can go on the custom on the configurer and, and then customize whatever you need if if you need to, to configure it. Not it's not only for enabling the open ID connect here. You can uh, you can configure everything. Uh, and then um, if I have a login, meaning if I'm using any other grant type than just the client credentials grant type, then I'm, I want to make sure that the login method will be accessible. So I have to provide somehow the um, uh, situation where you need to access the login and, and you, you have to access it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the exception handling method here 
and I will provide the authentication entry point. And non you can change it, yeah? You can customize it, you know, you can customize your login page, but if you don't customize the login page, then you can simply uh, use the uh, URL authentication entry point and the path, the default path is, uh, is login. Do I have one more? Okay. And then I have the second filter for the application. And now, because I have two of them, I will use the order annotation, okay? And what I'm going to do here is I'm, I'm going to provide the details about authentication and authorization for this app, which is if I need the user to log in I will have to provide them somehow with a login. It can be HTTP basic if you want, but I would say let's try with a form login because it's a little bit nicer. Uh, and then, yeah, you you can uh, you can uh, use the authorized request C copilot just to learn the, exactly the bad things from what I've been reading, writing. Anyway, we we don't need to do anything special, so we just can authenticate everything, so like close everything, and that's it. And these are the two first two filters, okay? Um, okay, I I don't want to go um, to go deeper for the moment, so I I want to give you the chance to take a break because um, we are like close to the uh, half of the presentation, uh, and. Um, yeah, as I said, give you the chance to take a coffee, uh, get some fresh air, and then we can uh, we can discuss further. Let me take a, a, fur a last series of questions if they are before you you go out, and then I will be waiting for you in 20 minutes, meaning 11, because that uh, clock of mine is one hour um, after. Um, questions, please. The URL for GitHub, you mean? Yeah, just so we can check it in the pod. Sure. And by the way, since uh, there, are, there are two things I wanted to tell you, and I want to give everyone a chance. I know some of you maybe will not return, so I, I want um, during the, the break to, uh, to give you the... One, first of all, please do uh, share the feedback in the application. Secondly, if you want... Um, to have a chance to get this copy for me, signed or not, whatever you want. You have just to scan the QR code and put your name. But please, if you choose to um, go to another presentation, try to be back at least at the end so I can find you and give you the book, okay? So I, I, want, I really want to give everyone a chance. It's, you, you can... Um, find some other presentation if it's this one is too boring for you or maybe you already know these things but I want you to be able to, to win that book um, anyway so if you want you just put your name in there at the end of my talk I will randomize it and whoever wins it can take it from me the URL you see there is the one with uh, all the details, hopefully, uh, including the examples I will create now. I, I will push them at the end. So you will get everything at the end. And if there are other questions, aside from, please, yes. The question is, if I'm working on the authorization server at the moment, no, but I've been a committer at the beginning of the project because it's an open source project. And guys, if you want to help, my advice is, of course, help as much as possible with open source projects, including the authorization server. So you can do that. It's, it's available for anyone to contribute to it. There are some simple contribution rules. You can read them on the page if you need my help to tell you 
uh, which are the page uh, pages you you need to get uh, uh, started with i can you can ask me after the presentation and i can help you with that uh, but yes you can help yes i did help why i'm not helping now because i don't have any more time i would love to be able to help uh, to continue helping maybe i will come back to that when uh, i managed to like finish that book that i still in progress and i i i, I wasn't lazy i'm i'm just joking uh, i've been joking at the beginning of the presentation i'm not lazy it's just hard stuff to to finish writing a book so that's why i'm not contributing now anymore but yes i was Oh yes, yes. So uh, you, I, I, am I trying to use the framework? Are you trying to build your own little T-flow for OFO? Not, not mine. Uh, I was involved um, some months ago uh, with an organization that started using it, and I helped them with building at least a part of it because then I moved to another project. So yes, I have been involved with using the authorization of server framework for building an authorization server uh, custom for an organization. Yes, please. Yes, is this uh, demo you are planning to do a replacement of T-Flow? Uh, kind of, yes, I'm going to build an authorization server and then a resource server. And depending on how much time I have, I can show the JVT, the opaque token, everything. Yeah, that's what, I, what I'm trying to do. Cool. Then I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for you to be back at Sharp, okay? Cool, thank you. Okay, I think we can start. Most of you are back, thank you very much. Um, so we were dealing with, with writing our authorization server that we then want to test. Um, as I said, I'm going to start with the most, most complex case, so I will have to implement all the components that we have seen earlier. Uh, we have already went through the uh, filters and now we need user credentials uh, because we will um, test the authorization code grant type and we need uh, the client credentials as well. So let's do that. Now in terms of the user credentials, I have a good news is the uh, user details service component that you use with any uh, Spring security uh, application. So nothing special happens here. With uh, the client credentials, we use the registered client and the registered client repository uh, classes. And uh, that's for, for some of you who have used the older way of implementing this stuff, might sound uh, a little bit strange because they were they were named previously client details and client detail service so they were really named like that in the previous uh, dependencies and now they changed the names to register client and the register client repository um, but it's just a, a name change they they represent the same thing and we can use them similarly so let's let's do that let's put them in our application uh, so I, I need a bin of type um, user details service and you know user details service is an interface you use and you can you can implement it um, and you can provide the logic um, to to get the user details from a database from an endpoint from from whatever you you need now in this demonstration i will not use a database for either the user or the client details because it would take too much time and i don't want you to focus on database stuff but on the spring security it doesn't make sense to lose time so i'm going to use the in memory user details manager implementation which as the name suggests it keeps the details in memory and as you probably know or you will find it now you only use it with demonstrations and examples okay so uh, I need the user details um, instance. Okay, we can. Let's call it Bob. I don't necessarily need the the no op there because I will use the um, uh, no password encoder anyway, and I'm gonna return new in memory user detail manager of that user so I have now a user and then uh, 
and then a password encoder and again just because it's a demonstration I will, will use the NOOP password encoder which as the name suggests is uh, a password encoder that doesn't encode the password actually you can go in its implementation and you will see that it uses the raw password that's why we don't use it and that's why it's only for demonstration purposes but I do recommend you when you learn something with Spring Security to use the NOOP password encoder because Otherwise, if there is something wrong, you, you at least excluded the fact that it's something wrong with the password encoder. And you can then change it with bcrypt or something differently. And now I need the registered client repository. So registered client repo repository. And again, normally I will return uh, an in-memory registered client repository, like same as for the user in my example, but normally I would implement the registered client repository interface and I would provide with my app with the logic of where should the client details come from, and they usually come from a database or somewhere, especially because for the client it's not only the, the client ID and the secret, which are the credentials, uh, usually you, you need to provide with a little bit more details like the redirect URIs, like, yeah, you will see them now. So I, I need a register client to uh, prove my demonstration. Um, and I will use the with ID, um, whatever you want to put here, okay. And don't, don't make a confusion between this ID and the client ID because this is basically just as like the primary key. Uh, it's the internal ID. You can make it a unique identifier. You can make it something. But the client ID, which is basically the client's username, if I can put it like that, that's the client ID. You have to, to, to provide it separately. So let's call it client and secret secret um, and then um, the what uh, redirect URIs we do need that uh, where do we want to redirect let's just try to use uh, the box something like that okay the devox website well, that page probably doesn't exist, so when the redirect will happen, we will get a 404, but we will still be able to see the authorization code, no? So that's what we need. Normally, the page would exist, yeah, and the, the client would do something with it. We need the scopes, at least, at least a, a scope. And if you use OpenID Connect, because we enabled it as we discussed, uh, you have the standard OpenID Connect scopes. Uh, so I can I can add one of these. I can I can use the OpenID scope, for example. Uh, the client authentication method. You can disable it completely, like uh, even if you use, because we will use now Pixie and and. People sometimes ask me, can we use both of them? Like, can we have here uh, also client credentials and Pixie at the same time? And I would say, yes, normally you, you can. I, I don't remember to have seen in any specification that you should not be able to do that. So if you want, you, we can like still use the client credentials even if we, we enable Pixie. And very importantly, the grant types, no? So we need to, to specify, oops. We need to specify which are the grant types that we expect to be um, available. So we, we can have multiple. By the way, for the scopes, so you can have multiple scopes. You can just add the scope method one after the other. You also have the scopes method if you want to put them in a, a list, actually through a consumer, but it's the same thing. You can have multiple redirect URIs, so there, there is the possibility where you have multiple options for the client and the client can decide that it goes to one or the other through the request. Uh, you can have multiple grant types, like you can uh, allow the client to choose 
uh, which, uh, which grant type to use. And we are going to use the authorization code grant type. Now, I'm not sure if I will have time to go into that, but uh, if in a, in a real world app, the token expires, let's say normally you would allow the token to live for say 20 minutes, uh, you don't want after those 20 minutes to force the user to log in again. And that's why the refresh token grant type exists. The refresh token is a way for the client that already has a token but which have expired, which has expired, to regenerate a new access token. If you want to use the refresh token, you can enable it by adding it like as an authorization, uh, as a grant type. So, for example, if I will uh, let my configuration this way, uh, then uh, my client will also be provided with a refresh token, not only with uh, um, an access token, and my client will be able to, cho to choose to use the um, refresh token flow to get a new uh, access token without forcing the user to re-log in. So, I had the client and now, I have a user and a client. And again, normally, the user and the client details will not be just written like that, hard-coded. They will come from somewhere. They will be secured, especially the credentials, yeah, but all the other uh, essential information. But for us here, it should work. And um, I do need still the app settings. I took it like clockwise. Um, I do need the app settings and then I need the key pairs management because I'm going to implement um, my uh, server with uh, JVTs. Uh, so, this used to have another name. I think now it's authorization server settings, but uh, if you will check uh, the documentation for previous um, versions, it was named differently. I don't even remember the, the name it first had this pin, but it was another one. And now, normally here you can, if you want, you can configure stuff related to the, like the endpoints, for example. Uh, if you want them to be different than the convention, you can choose to make your endpoints differently. Uh, everything that's normally related to, to the general yeah, settings of the authorization server, including the issuer. But we don't need to do that. Okay, and let's make it a bin. And then the last that we need to implement is the key pairs management. Now what I'm gonna do, because it's the only thing that I can do quickly, uh, is to generate um, a key pair when the app starts. Normally, the key pairs should not be generated by the application. They should be secured somewhere in a vault. You read them from there. But it depends a lot where you keep them on the logic that you have to write. But that, that's not important because the only thing you, you need to remember is that you uh, need to, to define this... Uh, um, component, which is called the key source. Um, JW key source of security context. And we will call it the key source. And we will make this a bin. See, if you, so the only thing that you need to implement is this key source which should provide you with the list of, of keys in the end so that's basically what, what you need to do. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use an in-memory I think it was called in-memory or something key set or mm, I don't remember exactly I will see it but I will generate it using Java security. So let's use a key pair generator. And uh, try to build an RSA key. I think we will deal with a lot of exceptions, so let's be lazy and just add a try catch from the very beginning. 
never do that in a real world app, no? Um, initialize it with the size. Generate the key pair. Obtain the public RSA key. Now we do know that this is um, we, we we do know that this is uh, RSA because we we asked for RSA up here, so we know the implementations. Unfortunately, with Java security, there is at least no way that I know in which I can avoid a casting here because um, I, I will need to put it in a key pair that will be then uh, added to a set. I think what I was searching for was something like immutable key set. Oh, yeah, that was the implementation. Uh, so I don't have to implement it my own. I, I just choose this, this implementation, which is basically a set of, of key pairs. So a set of this object that I will need in the end. So something like that, that's what I'm looking for. Okay. And that if I, I manage to get this, then I, I in the end will have a component managing one key one key that always changes whenever I restart the application. We see that that's why this is not realistic because you would, it wouldn't be possible. No, it, it means that when the container crashes and the app restarts, then you would have a different key. Then uh, obviously all the tokens that you have previously generated are not valid anymore. No, so that's why the key needs to be static and stored somewhere secure and you just read it from there. That, but that again depends on on what technology you choose for the vault and stuff like that. So now, again, there is not really uh, a way I know how to not uh, have to cast this. So I'm gonna cast it. Get the private key, get the RSA public key. Okay, um, and then this is something wrong here. It's the key set. Why oh, it's a key set? Oh, it's a key set. No, it's, that's good. That's good. So I need a key set of one key. Okay, of a JWK key. Okay, finally. Um, does that? I'm not totally sure. This uh, looks a little bit strange. So it was the RSA key, I think. But not imported correctly. And I think an ID is also mandatory. And that's it. Uh, yeah, don't, don't laugh. So this is very important, actually. You will see this in the header of the JVT token if we implement it correctly. And it's the one that is used by the resource server to validate that the token is correct. Well, if you want, I can put one, two, three, four, five. That's the same for me. But it's, it's the one that you will see. And normally, of course, again, this would be something you read from somewhere, so you will not write it like this. And then I, we, we should be able to simply add a key here or something like that. And 
hopefully, if I didn't make any mistake, uh, now we should be able to use this um, authorization server. So let's start it. Let's start it, make sure if, if it works. If it doesn't, then we'll have to figure out why. But uh, if everything is fine, then it should start. And then we should be able to uh, already use it. OK? So first good news is that it seems it started. And now we will see if we have a second good news. It means that we will, will be able to follow the authorization code grant type. So what's the first thing uh, we need to do? Going back to my presentation, the first thing is redirecting the user to a login. This is done through an endpoint that is called the authorize endpoint. The second thing that we need to do is to get a token here. This is done through a second endpoint that is called a token endpoint. Where do you get all these tokens from? Well, if you enable the OpenID Connect, it comes with the OpenID configuration endpoint, and you should be able to find this in any authorization server that claims uh, that it implements OpenID Connect. So, someone, I think a few people actually during the break asked me about Keycloak. Can we use the same things you show here with Keycloak? The answer is yes, Keycloak, as far as I know, implements correctly OpenID Connect. So, in your case, you should be able to call this endpoint, and of course, using the right address and port, but you should be able to call this endpoint and see uh, the same thing as I see here. If I correctly remember in Keycloak, this configuration, this link configuration ap appears or used to appear even on the first page after you authenticate it. Okay, so that's, that's my answer for those who, um, who asked me about Keycloak. So, and you should be able to see something similar. Okay, you know that the endpoints can be customized. And today you even learned that you can do that also with the Spring Authorization Server um, using this bin. No? So that means that you should call this endpoint and make sure which are your endpoints. Don't, don't take them. They are not necessarily the same that we, we, we will use here. These are our, in our case, the endpoints, yours might be different. But you see all of them here. And what you need is the authorization endpoint and the token endpoint. What else do we see here? Uh, aside from endpoints, we see which authentication methods are supported by our authorization server. We see this keys URI. This will tell us which are the keys configured in our, uh, uh, in our authorization server. And the result is this. So I'm, I'm now calling the keys endpoint just to show you that it is the key I have configured. Look at the key ID, that KID is the key ID actually, 12345, it was the, my blah, blah, blah previously, okay? And this endpoint is probably one of the most important if you use um, non-opaque tokens, JVT tokens, because this is what the resource server, the backend will call to find the, the, the public part of the key uh, the key pair that was used to sign the token, and that's how the backend validates that the token uh, is uh, is valid. So, uh, no, because you you might wonder, okay, so I get the token, I send the token to the backend. How does the backend know this token is valid? If it is a non-opaque token and you used cryptographic ways to sign it, then what the resource server does, meaning the backend, what the backend does is calling the keys endpoint. It gets all the uh, all the uh, public parts. In my case, only one because we only configured one key. But remember, they are usually multiple and they are rotated automatically by the authorization server, meaning that not all the tokens will be signed with the same key. And then it uses the key ID, which mandatory needs to be unique, to find out of the many public parts, which is the public part uh, it should use to validate the token. And it uses that public part to validate the token. So that's, that's why this endpoint is, is important. Uh, then if you use OpenID Connect, 
you also have the user info endpoint because remember the purpose of Op OpenID Connect is authentication and the user. Uh, the user info endpoint is not part of the OAuth 2 specification but is part of the OpenID Connect protocol. Uh, the other uh, endpoints or the ground types supported. Uh, funny, I'm not sure exactly why it says the client credentials support. Has, I have no client, uh, but it's probably related only to the, the server. Um, the, the endpoint you can use for revocation. You can revoke tokens. Tokens are anyway valid for a short period of time. I'm not sure which is the default we can see. You can configure it. I can, I can show you how to configure it. Uh, but it should be short enough. However, what happens if you find out that the token has uh, been uh, lost somehow? Someone, you, you, you find out that someone really managed to get a token and they might be able to, to use it. Then you can revoke the token and the authorization server uh, also provides you with this uh, feature, this capability. Uh, now, my recommendation is you don't always need revocation. So it, it depends on the app you implement. Sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. Calculate uh, well if you need or not, because if you need revocation, what I will show you later is that you also need introspection, uh, which makes your app less performant. So it's, of course, we always in software make compromises. No, that's all we do. So you want more security, you lose somewhere. Performance, maintainability, no? And any other non-functional requirement. Uh, the introspection endpoint. The introspection endpoint uh, is primarily used when you have opaque tokens. By the way, does everyone know what opaque and non-opaque means? Because I'm, I'm using this. Okay, so not all of you. Sorry for that. So I'm, sometimes, please do ask questions if you don't understand. Because sometimes I'm, I'm not really uh, careful, and um, and I might use like terms that that you might not know. So, op non-opaque. Is JVT. It's a non-opaque token. The reason we call it non-opaque is because it contains data inside. So if you take, uh, we don't have a token yet, but if, if you take a JVT, we will do that. It is actually nothing more than a base64 encoding of a JSON, which JSON contains details inside. So you will find the username there, you'll find roles of the user, you'll find you can customize them, put it there, whatever you want anyway. Uh, a non -opaque, uh, an opaque token is a token that doesn't contain anything inside. It's just, just like a, a, a proof of authentication, but without any, any other meaning, without containing anything about the user. Uh, if you use opaque tokens because you don't have the info inside, then first of all, it's not signed. Any, anyhow, so you uh, you can't you meaning the resource server can't prove anymore via a cryptographic approach that the uh, token is valid or not. And secondly, the the backend will need the details about the user for whom the token was generated because otherwise it can't apply the authorization rules. No, so to do that, it has to call the authorization server and grab all these details, and that's called introspection. So introspection is primarily used when you use opaque tokens. It can, it can also be used if you have non-opaque tokens and you want to use the revocation of the tokens because a token might be revoked here at the authorization server level. Uh, and the resource server in that case needs to know. So it validates that the token is not only it, it's valid through its cryptographic signature, but it wasn't revoked either. Okay. Um, yeah, and the, the, this is the main approach which I recommend you do if you if you want that. The third approach, uh, the third is actually the second. Um, for the second approach for introspection was blackboarding, where you have a database in between. But remember that sharing persistent layers is not really something that we discovered. At least that architecturally is um, always uh, the best choice. You have to decide. Um, yeah. Scope supported, and yeah, that's mainly it. So we, we've seen, we've seen that we have access to the public part of the only key we have in that set. We we've seen 
uh, that uh, it is indeed seems to be implementing OpenID Connect properly because we have uh, access to the OpenID Connect configuration. Uh, then what we need to do is to follow the, the flow. And again, this is the flow because um, I know you asked me. This is the, the flow that um, you can follow with Keycloak as well if you want. No, it's, uh, it's just the specification flow. So we need the two endpoints, the authorization and uh, the, um, the token. Now, I already prepared the uh, URLs because I would have lost a lot of time to put all this in place and you are already bored, I see you. Hopefully not. Okay. Um, so, I will show them on a slide first and then I'm using them. But I'm, I want to make sure you all know why I'm putting all these parameters here. The URL, you know already where I took it from. I took it from the OpenID Connect configuration response. Then, the response type code means I'm using the authorization code grant type. Client ID, client, is the name of the client. I need to make sure that it matches precisely with my client here. Where it is? Oh, here it is, client, okay. Um, Scope needs to be one of the scopes I have registered for that client. Open ID is there, if I correctly remember. See? The redirect URI, look at this, HTTPS. I have to be very careful. I either put it correctly here or use HTTP on both sides. Because if I, if I don't do that, this is enough to give you headaches if you are beginning with the authorization server. You will see, you will you'll basically have uh, a very cold error, which doesn't give you necessarily a clue on what's wrong. And my advice for you who are starting and maybe you will want to build this, uh, I promise you what I put on the PDF document is working. I tested it previously very well. If something doesn't work, the main mistake people do is to miss it's enough one letter here. If you, if you have one parameter that's not matching, that's most likely the problem. Okay, so just pay a little bit more attention. Take, take again all the parameters and make sure that what you put on the request is exactly what you have configured in the authorization server. If you go even one step further and you create a database and you write an implementation for your registered client repository or user detail service, then make sure that what you grab and the way you grab them from the database is correct. See, that's why I'm using first in memory. When I learn things, I want to do things as possible, as uh, decoupled as possible, because if I started now, I, there could be a lot of places where, where I have errors, no? Now, at least I know I have minimized the, the number of places where I can have errors. Uh, the redirect URI, uh, and then we have the code challenge, which is part of the pixie, Sorry, back here. Part of the Pixie, we discussed that when you ask for the authentication, you provide what? The hash of a random value. To make things easier, I prepared both the verifier and the, uh, the challenge up front. What the verifier is, it is a random string. What the challenge is, it's a, a SHA over the random string. So um, normally, at every request, you have you, the client, your web app, your mobile app, whatever the client is, has to generate another pair of verifiers and challenges. To make things easier, I will just use the pair I have generated just before this presentation. Um, yeah. And, and of course, being that there might be multiple ways in which you hash the verifier, you need to tell the server what hashing algorithm you've used, no? Because otherwise it doesn't know how to verify it later. So that's it. That's the minimum you need to, to send. And I, I just put it here for me to be easy to copy it. It's the same thing that I have shown you. 
So let me check one once more if I use HTTPS here. Yeah, it's fine. I'm going back to browser. Okay, I'm redirected to login. And now I need to use exactly the right credentials, bill and password in my case. Oh, I think I missed it. And of course, the page doesn't exist on the Devox site. It makes sense, yeah? It's a 404 not found, but if you look careful to the URL, we've been redirected here with a valid authorization code that we can use. And we can use only once. So if I fail, I still have to generate another one. And the authorization code, this is one of the biggest rules. It's usable only once, meaning even if you used it and you failed, you have to generate another one. Normally, if, say, DevOx website was implementing uh, OAuth 2 with this server, it would have now continued doing what I will be doing from Postman, meaning calling the token endpoint, which is the second endpoint we need to call. That will provide the authorization server the proof of the authorization code, the verifier from the pixie, and expect to get back an access token. And it looks like that. It's a post, it's not written here, but you can trust me. You need a client ID. You need, uh, again, the redirect URI. You need to specify the grant type. You need the authorization code. And you need the verifier based on which the challenge we have previously sent has been done, okay? Has been made. So I'm going to take, actually, I don't need it because I've prepared it in post one directly. So this is, this is it. The only thing I need to make sure is that I use the right authorization code, because if I will not use the right authorization code, it will definitely not work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to carefully copy this in here and then send it. And it worked. Yay. So we have authorized the access token. It's a JVT by default. We have the refresh token because we asked for it. So this refresh token wouldn't have existed if I wouldn't have added the refresh token grant type. That's not wrong. If you don't put the grant type, it simply doesn't appear in the response, which is fine. We have the ID token because we use the open ID connect. And we have the expiration, which seems to be 300 seconds by default. Okay. Uh, in case you had a question, uh, I now know I probably will forget till the, my next presentation. Let's check what's inside this, actually. So I'm going to copy it. JVT IO. And you can use JVT IO, IO to decode. Um, base64 decoder token, uh, which is composed of three parts, the header, the body, and uh, the signature. In the header, you can see probably the most important information, the key ID. This is how the resource server knows what part, which, which public part um, to, to take to validate token. And then we have the, the data. Our user is Bill from that client, the scope, the issuer, the expiration time, and then, then we have the signature. So it looks as we, we uh, expected, at least it's a mini, minimal JVT token that you, um, you can now use uh, in the resource server. So let's, let's build a resource server, okay? Yes, please. Uh, when you did the JWT sets and stuff, you imported some classes that were not from Spring. Yeah. Spring security. Yeah, yeah. I I use Java Java security for that. Uh, let me go back to the 
So I think this one, this one, the Nimbus one. So this is this one is the Nimbus. Is the implementation. So you uh, you have some contracts in the in, in Java security, but you also need the implementation. So I, I simply used th this comes. I, I use this method because the um, the dependency comes out of the box with uh, with uh, the dependencies I have, so I don't have to add something el else. But I could have used like something else like Bouncy Castle to to do the, the same thing. But the, the reason I chose this is because I. I made it as simple as possible, because if I would have started now to add other dependencies and stuff like that, just to build a key, which is like from my point of view not really the most important part of today's presentation, I'm, I, I would have troubled you. That's why I chose that. Uh, but uh, again, so what you see here is anyway unrealistic. Now remember that the key is never generated by the authorization server. It should be read from somewhere, because otherwise, now this token will automatically become invalid, the one that I generated, even if it's, say, not expired, it will become invalid if I restart the application, because a new queue will be generated, so suddenly the public part will not match anymore, no? So that's why uh, I didn't um, uh, put too much attention into, into the key pair generation, I just did it the way I knew it. Yeah. Cool, thank, thank you. you. Other questions? Or should I continue with the resource server? Please. It should be three uh, three dependencies. Um, this three. So is the OAuth authorization server, uh, the Spring Security, and the web. Uh, now I will be honest with you. I'm not 100% sure if Spring Security is still needed here. If you added the authorization server, it might come together with. But at most, these three should be needed to to have everything. Okay. Any other question before I go to the resource server? So my plan is now to build a resource server that works with this authorization server. So we have almost the full system in place. So yeah, let's let's go file new project resource server one. I'm not sure why I name it one. I don't think I will have time to, <laughs> to create multiple, but uh, if I set the authorization server one, I will put resource server one. Um, again, I'm, sh I'm sure uh, you want me to use Java 21. Uh, anything else? No, I created the first one with Gradle. I will continue with Gradle because otherwise, uh, but uh, the examples in the PDF are with Maven, I think. But again, it doesn't make uh, any difference, no. So I'll make a web application. It's a backend. I, I'm going to secure it with Spring Security, and if I want it to be a resource server, all the dependencies, runtime dependencies that I need will come just by adding the starter. So again, I, I have three dependencies that I, I have added. Okay. Uh, no, I don't... Uh, What the heck? Sorry. <laughs> so why is it, why isn't it not not? Uh, because you're opening it in the same window. So did I did I choose that? Sorry. That's Might be tired. That's what I assume it is because that's what normally happens. Okay, but did I choose that myself? Somehow. It's an IntelliJ setting. It's an IntelliJ settings. Let me check that. Sorry for that. I should have checked that before. So, um, okay, so I, you, you said I created it, but I need to open it. So that's, in my case, it should be throughout the many, many, many presentations somewhere here. Yes, you are right. Yeah, it's here. But I don't want to disconnect this one. <laughs> I really don't want... I, I can I know I can choose disconnect, but then the port will remain open, and I don't want that either. Open a new copy of IntelliJ. Ah, that's a good a good point. Yeah, can I do that? No, I can't do that. It's strange. 
So where do I find that setting? Should we ask ChatGPT? <laughs> new window. This one. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. So I'm opening it in a new window. Extraordinary. <laughs> Cool. And I have to do things here. So, uh, load the Gradle project, okay. So, I have to do two things. First of all, I need one endpoint because I, I need to secure something. If not, I can't prove anything, no? So, I need to go here, say controllers, and, and have a demo controller with the simplest possible endpoint. Okay, so I, I, I guess that's fine with everyone. And now the configuration. Let's name it security config. It's a configuration file, so we use the configuration annotation. And now we need the security filter chain, no? the way we've learned earlier. If we were on a, an older version, we would have extended web security configure adapter and so on and so on. Okay. Um, okay. HTTP security which we use to build the instance that we need and then for simplicity let's just assume we use http basic we want all our endpoints to be uh, to require at least authentication Yeah, you are right. Sorry. I, 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 it's either because I'm tired now, either because of the karaoke yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, it would have ended up, I, I have to do that anyway to work. So, of, of course, why am I using HTTP basic? Some, something I can use here, but it's not HTTP basic. It's the resource server, because that's what we are, we are building, no? It's <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, And then now we need to write the configurer, and it depends on which what 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 exactly we want to configure here. So we will choose between either JVT or opaque token. Now, why is this not called non-opaque and opaque? Because JVT is anyway the only non-opaque implementation we are using. Okay, but if you want to use JVT, you continue with JVT. If you would want to use opaque. And again, we can try it later. Let's now continue with JVT, but you can use opaque as well. And then, it's, you have another configuration here. Of course, we need to use a different um, name for the variable. And the uh, only thing uh, you need if you want to use the key set is to set the key set URI which again normally should not be hard coded you know the story it should be at least in a configuration file but now the only thing we need to make sure is that is the one that's working for us which is this one okay and yeah definitely add the bin here so um we are defining an authorization server. We made sure that to call any endpoint, you at least need to be authenticated. This will be will prove that we implemented things correctly. And we chose to use the key set URI. 
And if I want to also start this application, I need to change the server port because I can't um, start the same port um, on the same computer, no? And that should be it. That's the simplest possible uh, resource server. Let's, um, let's try it. Okay. So now, this token, I'm pretty sure it expired. I will show you one more thing. I can test this one with the introspection endpoint, which is this one. The introspection endpoint can be used to tell you if a token is still valid uh, and even give you details about the token in case of opaque tokens. Active false is probably because it expired. Uh, and if we really want to, to see that, we can also investigate it here and see what is the expiration time. It says 12.41 because of my uh, time zone, but you see that 41 is definitely smaller than 50. Okay, so it expired like nine minutes ago. Uh, what, what I do when I, when I um, write examples, I, I prefer to configure the tokens with, uh, with a larger time to live. And if you want to configure the tokens with a larger time to live, what you can do is use the token settings. And here you can, you can configure multiple things. Among these are the time to live. And also the token type should be some token format is if you want to change between JVT and opaque. So if you, we want later and we, if we will still have time later to, um, to, to make an example with opaque, that's the only thing we will change basically to get an opaque token. But the time to leave, so I think it uses a duration uh, of hours 24. Now we have one one day token. Okay, and I need to restart it, and anyway, I would have need to regenerate one, so not, not a big deal. To regenerate, I will follow the same steps. So, I'm authenticating, what was it, it's bill and password. I get the code. I'm going in Postman. I'm using the code and I got a different token. Let's see when is this one expiring. October October 4th, so it's tomorrow, okay? So expected, fine. And now uh, the other one I think is still running. Uh, so I, I can go back to Postman and it should be HTTP, localhost, 9090 and demo. And then you can choose to write it manually, authorization, bearer, and token. I think in Postman you can also find it here somewhere in authorization, uh, your choice. Uh, so you can say authorization, bearer, followed by the JVT token, and it works. Okay. So that's, I think, maybe the, the simplest uh, of the examples. Now, it should be, it should be. We can test it. The only thing we need to make sure is that we don't have any session in place or something here, because sometimes, sometimes I have that problem. I have a session in place. I don't know where to clean it. And uh, even if I don't provide, then it works because um, it gives a session. But no, in our case, it's, it doesn't. You see, uh, if I deactivated the, the token, or you can try using a wrong one or something, then it gives us a 401 unauthorized. If we put it back again, 200, okay. Yeah, it's fine. Cool. Yeah, it's, al it's always good to also test the, <laughs> the, um, the bad flow, because otherwise we are not sure that's working or not. 
Um, now, again, if I want to use an opaque token. Sure, please. Yes, 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 it is, it is verified, so you don't have to do anything. The only, the only thing you have to do is to configure this. Why? Because what the resource server does behind the scenes, like I did here in, uh, in Postman, it calls the endpoint, it finds the set, the set can contain multiple keys, it takes from the header of the token the key ID, searches through the whole set to find the same key ID. Of course, if it doesn't find it, it fails. If it finds it, gets the public part of the key and uses the public part to validate the token. Everything is behind the scenes. Other questions that I can answer now? Cool, excellent. So, um, if I want to use an opaque token, I was telling you that the only thing I need to do is to change the format. Um, which I think is reference for the opaque, to uh, for the opaque token. I'm going to restart it and try the flow again, and we should see a difference in... Um, in the token. Uh, we should actually see that it's not a GVT anymore. Um, okay, I will be, try to be quick again. Okay. And let's now generate the token. Yeah, and you can see it looks differently. No, you can see it's smaller. If you, it doesn't have three parts like a JVT needs to have. And if you really, really want, you can put it here, and it will not be recognized as a JVT. Um, and if I want to use it now. Well, it doesn't work anymore with the keys, no? So normally, in this case, I don't even need a key component. I, I can have it, but it's not used. This is now useless. So this one is useless now. Uh, if, if you want, I can comment it out, restart, and you will see that I can do the same stuff without it. The problem is not that one. The problem is actually... Um, Yeah, you are right, because I have open ID connect. Very good point. Ten, 10 points for Gryffindor. That's, that's true. That's true. I was only thinking about the flow, the authentication flow. I forgot about the ID token. In this specific case, yes, because, um, because I, have the, um, the, uh, I have enabled open ID connect, and I still have an ID token. And if you take a look here, you will see that indeed I, I have the ID token, and that one is still a JVT. I will tell you one, one secret, however. If I would have taken that component out, there, it would have still worked for me, and I, didn't, I wouldn't have failed it, because there is a, a, a similar source provided by convention by Spring Boot, <laughs> but I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, very good point, thank you. Cool, so uh, now going back to, to uh, our, the opaque tokens, because I was trying to, to tell you, so now, now you don't have a way to validate this token using the key, that is true. Uh, and you need the introspection. So you need to call the introspection endpoint, which we can actually test it again using our token, the one I, I've copied. And you can see the, the result, yeah? First of all, it's active because we kept the 24 hours expiration time, so it didn't expire. And then all the other details that the resource, the backend would need for the authorization now they are not coming in the token, which is opaque. That's why we call, we call it opaque. Now it comes through the response of the introspection. So if I want to make this work with introspection, then what I need to change here, okay, let's, let's say we leave it 
comment it out maybe uh, after the, my presentation you would like to test it and you don't want to forget although you also have it in the PDF file okay and obviously we use the opaque, to opaque token and then what we need is the introspection URI and eventually credentials in case you uh, chose to have basic HTTP authentication. So everything that the resource server needs to uh, call the introspection endpoint and get the response. So let's get it. And put it here. And I think it was like client and secret, never hard code credentials. Okay, it, it only works for, for us now for an example, but and I'm restarting it. And I should prove that still working with this token, with the opaque token. So normally, if I'm going to call the demo endpoint, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm using the opaque token and it should work, okay? And we can again try without it, it doesn't, okay? So the opaque token works correctly, okay. Um, going back to the presentation, I want to show you a few more things. Um, not necessarily demonstrate all of them because uh, yeah, there are a lot of things we can demonstrate. It would take us probably more than a day if we, we want to go uh, uh, at least over all of, uh, of the capabilities that the framework offers you. But I think you already got the point. You, you saw that how where to start from and um, with the PDA also that I have gave you, you should have everything in place. Now, a few questions I, I have often um, I got often from um, um, from different uh, developers. Uh, I want to cover them, and of course, then if you, you have if you have others, I will put them on my list. But a lot of people are at least curious about customizing the token. So, can we customize the JVTs, and how do we do that? What you need to know is that there is no like fixed format for how the JVT should look like. You can put things either in the header or in the body, although you shouldn't add them like randomly. Normally the header is for the metadata, the body is for uh, the rest of the information. There are a few other advices that I would like to give you. One of them is not to not to create not to not to create too large JVT tokens. So uh, my recommendation is to keep the tokens uh, short and only with essential information. So for example, if you have a profile picture, don't put it in the ID token or in the, or in the access token, uh, even if it's a small one. The larger the token is, remember the token will always be sent through all the requests and remember that it needs to be validated. So the signature depends on the header and on the body. So the more content you have, the more difficult will be to be validated and potentially might create your performance issues. Uh, but you can customize the tokens. So, and it's pretty straightforward to, cost, to, to customize the tokens. Um, and you need that, especially on the resource server side, because, uh, well, let's say on the authorization server side, uh, you can... Yeah, you, you can use what you have. In most cases, it's enough. But if you use different authorization servers, such as Keycloak, for example, because many of you told me, hey, I'm using Keycloak, um, you will be surprised. It's, I, I'm not sure it's by default understood by Spring Security, or at least not all the details. I think at least the, the roles or authorities might be different. And depending on how you customize your client from uh, and, and the token from the interface, you might have other things that you want to take from there. How do you do that? On the resource server side, you use a, a converter, which is simply plugged in as a bin in the context. So you don't need to do a lot of things. It's enough to, to plug in the bin. This is it, sorry. The first one is the authorization server. So this is how it looks like. You just have a class that uh, implements the converter of JVT and your 
authentication that you put in the uh, security context. And then you will have all the details in the parameter and you decide how you put them in your custom authentication. The only thing you need to do is this one on the resource server side. And that's something I'm sure I will see in your configurations because depending if you use Microsoft AD Azure, if you use uh, uh, Keycloak, if you use all of them, they provide in different ways the body, so you will need to, to customize it. If you want to customize it from, the, from your authorization server, the custom authorization server that you built, uh, then you need to plug in a bin on the authorization server, which is called uh, the uh, OAuth2 token customizer. And again, that's everything you need to do inside this method. You have the context on which you have all the details, and then you can build the claims um, which will be added to the, um, to the token as well. A full uh, example you find in the PDF that I gave you and also on my YouTube channel if you want to see me coding like I did uh, today during, my, during the presentation. I only have 20 minutes left, so I want to go straight through everything that remained. But if you still will have questions, uh, I will be available till Friday. Here you will find me uh, and we can discuss. And then on social media, so no worries. Uh, I will do my best to answer all, all your questions. Uh, we already discussed about going opaque, so fortunately I can skip over this. Uh, the only thing that we didn't, uh, we didn't discuss in details is multi-tenancy. And this is again a question that I see it comes more and more often. I think even today in the break there were two people asking me this. <laughs> so only today in the break. Uh, because it, it seems that there is a case, you know, it's a lot of situations where you end up needing to have multiple authorization servers. You might even have to implement different kinds of authorization servers. So you might have some of them using JVT, others using opaque. And then the question is, how do you deal with that? So how, how do you uh, implement an authentication on the resource server side, which now will need to know when to validate the token as a JVT and when to validate it as a, an opaque token? And even if you don't have this crazy case, you might have, like, we know all the things when we when we learn them in a tutorial or in a presentation they are they are so nice and great like i only had what to to write one line of code here and everything is out of the box and then you go there and in in the real life which is a, a jungle you have totally different things and you, you suddenly just putting the introspection uri doesn't work anymore no what do you do in that case uh so of course there is no framework that we can call a good framework if it doesn't provide you with all the possibilities to uh, customize everything you need. So the, the real power of a framework, the, when we say a, a framework is really powerful, is when it provides you conventionally everything, but it allows you to go as deep as possible and customize up to the like, most granular configuration. And I think that's what Spring does. And of course, all the part of its ecosystem, including Spring Security. And again, you need to, uh, to be, no, I will comment this out because it doesn't work. Uh, you need to, to be aware a bit about uh, the design from, of Spring Security behind the scenes, uh, which yeah, I didn't cover uh, today. Uh, if you need uh, it, Again, free on my YouTube channel or in my Spring Security in Action if you, if you take the book. Uh, but what you can do here is you can define a component of type Authentication Manager Resolver. The Authentication Manager in Spring Security uses authentication providers, and the authentication providers are the components that implement the logic for authentication. So what, what I want to tell you actually is that you can literally create your own logic on how to validate the token if you want that. Yeah. So if you are in a, in a situation where you need to uh, deal with multiple servers, such as this case, or maybe we are in that, that case where we need to integrate with a third party organization, but they have an old OAuth specification they implemented the way they knew 20 years ago. 
Did it happen ever to you? Have to work with, with, with some kind of software that doesn't fulfill the standard, no? I'm surprised to see so, so few hands. I, 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 would, I would have expected even more because it happens to me so often. It's, it's great when you have the specification or the protocols fulfilled. But we all know that, especially with older software, when maybe the specification didn't exist and maybe those guys didn't take the time to or didn't want to invest the money to upgrade it or to put it in place. Uh, and we need to integrate with them because we don't have any other chance. No, it's our cases where we need, we need to do that. In those cases, there is still hope. And the hope is Spring Security allows you to even implement your custom authentication if you need that. So you, you can define your own provider. This is an example, but I don't know why I chose this one because it's not the greatest, but I will show you in the PDF one more. Uh, it, why, why it's not the greatest? Because it actually, it, it still helps you, you know? It's that class JVT issuer authentication manager. It, it works out of the box when all, when all of the issuers, these are all uh, two ad addresses of two authorization servers, I think you, you guessed. But they have both of them to implement OpenID Connect. If you have this situation, which is, again, a happy one, no? You can easier implement it because Spring Security provides you with a class that already does the logic for this case, which is kind of still idealistic. But if you are in that situation that I explained you, where you have to integrate with the messy uh, software of someone else that's not fulfilling, fulfilling any standard, then what you can do it's even implementing like this. You know, this, this is a, still an easier example, but uh, it proves a little bit more. So here you have an authentication manager that knows how to deal with a JVT, uh, JVT authorization server, an authentication manager that knows how to deal with an op uh, opaque, and then based on her HTTP request, because that's what you get, you get the HTTP request, you have to differentiate, and then Obviously, when you write this logic here, that, I will tell it again, it should be in a different class and properly tested. Yeah. You have the request, and based on the request, you will decide, you will have to implement some logic to decide on the resource server, hey, I'm going to this one, or I'm going to this one. Or I'm going to test this token cryptographically, and another one, I'm going to introspect it. Or, whatever the logic is there. But yeah, there needs to be something on the request. You have to be able to differentiate on something. Like maybe you can even implement an algorithm like try this one and if it doesn't work, try the other one and if it doesn't work, try the other one. You can do that. It's your, it's your logic if you don't have any other chance. But you have to implement that logic. But the, the good news is that you can. So take a look. Again, I, I, I don't have the needed time now. It's only 15 minutes, and I want to close the presentation and leave you also with some time for the questions. But this 80-something pages PDF, it's what I could put to be, the say, the summary of, uh, of our today's uh, deep dive. Um, and uh, you can take a look and see on the example how it's implemented and it's described here as well. Um, yeah, and before closing, uh, leaving time for the questions and then giving also the book that I have promised, uh, I want to also tell you again what you can see next in the following days. A few presentations that some of them I will attend myself, some of them I would not be able to attend because I have another one at the same time. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, because I, I, you guys are here, I, I guess you are interested in security, so I, I just chose the, the stuff uh, on security. So I, it's, I think it's later today, the security Spring Boot microservices from Matt, uh, and then you have the Java vulnerabilities from Garrett. Uh, and of course on Thursday, if you want to see again a summary of our talk today, you can attend, uh, attend my um, my talk, which is a shorter version of what we discussed today. Uh, or maybe you want to come there just because I will also give a book there. <laughs>
or you can tell your friends that they can attend if you really like this presentation. Uh, if you don't want to see me again, uh, and uh, I can understand that, I would strongly recommend Brian's presentation, which is at the same time with mine's. If I wouldn't have the presentation, I would probably have attended this one. So Brian, you maybe know him, he's very knowledgeable in security. Uh, he's also running the J4, J4 conference. He's a Java champion, so uh, one of the person to follow. Um, and uh, again, I recommend his presentation. And then uh, later on is um, Daniel's presentation of OpenID Connect. And of course, my friend Thomas securing the supply chain uh, that is, I think, on Friday. Um, you know how to find me in case you need to find me after this conference on social media. Um, okay, of course, I strongly recommend my books because they are my books. <laughs> and in, in case you want, yeah, I, would, I will now give you a few more minutes time in which you can ask me questions. If you still have, you can scan the QR code and then I will randomize. You have the GitHub and Remember to give me those nice five stars and your feedback in the feedback section of the application. So take a minute for that if you have the time. Thank you very much for being here and now I'm listening to your questions. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Oh, well, God, that, that's a good point. I think it's just about the separation of concerns. One of them is related to I the identity of the user, and the other one for the access, okay. which comes from the protocol. That's how I, I would use them normally. Thank you. Please. <coughs> no, you, you, you're there. Very good question, actually. Why would I choose? The question is, why would I choose to build my own authorization server? Honestly, I never asked myself that question ever because I don't really choose that. I'm forced to do that by different organizations when they, they ask me. So I had, as a consultant or as a developer, because I'm, I'm working as a developer and consultant, I had been put in the situation where I had to do that because some specific, I don't know, um, stakeholders didn't want to use an open source solution like Keycloak or didn't want to use something like Cogn uh, Cognite or what, whatever they are, Okta and the other solutions. I, w I don't know how to answer. I guess it depends on, on the system. Would I ever choose that? Maybe, I think it depends on what the system is. Maybe if I think about something like, I want to not depend on anyone or something like that probably, but I'm not sure if I can give you a, like more than that. Because <laughs> again, I didn't ask myself the question is, I'm usually the guy building the stuff because I'm, told I'm, I'm, I'm the worker there, you know, putting my, my fingers on the keys. <laughs> Thank you. Any other question? Did you all guys scan the QR code, the ones of you, who, of course, who want that? Anyone who still does that? And if not, let me actually then um, finish completely and, uh, and give you the book. So I, I should have here all, all your names. I, oops. Uh. Oh, oh. Whew. <laughs> I wanted to, to actually make it, make it uh, just bigger. Okay, fine enough. Number two is me, so I will skip over. I will, I will start from, from three and two, oh, you're many, 74. So random, random, okay. So I'm starting from three and up to 74 is the last one, okay? 74, bound. And the result is 24. And 24 is heat, heat, sorry, did I pronounce it correctly? Sorry if I missed it. Cool, thank you very much, guys. Hope to see you soon at another event, if not at my next presentation. And yeah, keep in touch. <laughs>